welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. We are welcoming Dr. Doreen Grambichet back to Good the morning. show. We haven't had you for the last two weeks and we've I missed know. you terribly. Although I must say that Evelyn Kong has been filling in and she does a wonderful job. But she there's is. there's nothing like having you. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Thrilling <laughs> to be here with you. We we for people who have never watched the show before, and every day we have new viewers that are that are finding us, and we so appreciate having you here. Dr. Grampichet is, I believe, the preeminent expert in the field of autism. And it's a thrill and a privilege to have her here with us. She's been working in this field for more than 30 years. In fact, I think it's this year that you get to say 40. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, I know. Don't we? We all want her skin cream. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> That's Crazy. the next thing you have to do is put out a line of skincare for all of us <laughs> uh, so that we can hope to be as young looking as you are. Uh, but in any case, she's worked with very small children up through senior citizens and everything in between. Uh, amazing, amazing clinician, but truly a Thank visionary you. and an advocate for our families and for our kids. And we're so lucky to have her here answering your questions. But we do like to remind you at the start of every show that there is no expert in any field that could give individual specific advice in this format. So when you write in, be as specific as you can be, but know that Dr. Grampichet will be giving you answers of a general nature to help you to make decisions on what to look for next, what questions to ask. I always say that when you don't even know what question to ask when you go to an expert, it's you're more, not likely to be successful, plus it's likely to take longer, and we know that those appointments cost a lot of money. So, thrilling to have thanks, you here. so it's, good to be here. Thank you very much, and thanks for your kind words, and it's always a pleasure, and I am worried because we have so many questions. Well, and we're, we've are we already had more questions come in since I printed these, but oh my so gosh. we're not going to get to all of them, but we're going to do our best do our to best. skip around and get to enough um, that can help. But I'm going to jump right in. Uh, our first question, uh, hi Shannon, thanks for all that you do. Question for Dr. Doreen. My five-year-old son has recently started acting up in his preschool. Uh, he, I'm not going to use name because I think this came into us on Facebook. He was diagnosed at three and has only gotten support through our intermediate unit. Mm -hmm. We are trying to get ABA, but it's been a challenge. So I'm on skills doing what I can do there through there. We are in Pennsylvania and being told that there are plenty of forms of treatment for autism. David has begun, I said the name anyway, That's but we okay. don't know the last name, uh, has become very angry. He has hit his teacher multiple times, and when he wants, he stands up and yells at her in her face. He is becoming very disruptive, and we just don't know why. He is verbal and reads, but I wonder if he really understands what we are saying to him as we try to correct his behavior. Help with two exclamation points. We've tried rewarding good behavior and encouraging when he is a good boy, but it's not working. And he just keeps getting worse every day. Thank you in advance for all that you do. Oh, okay. Yeah. So our kids, I, I don't know what intermediate unit is. It doesn't matter. You seriously need immediately, and I think uh, no matter where you are, you need to ask for an IEP, and in the IEP, you need to ask them to do what's called a functional behavior assessment, FBA. Um, what they do in a, in a, hopefully they will have a board certified behavior analyst, BCBA, um, who works with the school or consults with the school at least and can come in and conduct the FBA. Then FB, if you're on skills, what I suggest that you do immediately is that you go on that portion of skills that's called CIFA. That's the card indirect functional assessment. When you go on there, you'll be asked a bunch of questions about these behaviors. And what it'll do is help you separate the behaviors so that you're looking at one behavior at a time. So like you mentioned a few things here, like yelling in her face um, or uh, becoming disruptive or various other things. And, the CIFA will help you kind of separate them out and do one at a time. And, but then more importantly, it's not about the topography or what the behavior actually is, but it's about the function. Um, please, and function means the reason for the behavior. Everybody needs to really always remember that challenging behaviors like tantruming, yelling, hitting, aggression, running away, all that sort of stuff, they have nothing at all to do with the diagnosis of autism in terms of symptoms. They are not a symptom of autism. 
they're a symptom of being frustrated. So our kids, whether he can't understand or he can't communicate, or it, the environment is just not fair, so it's too hard for him, and he's not able to keep up, or he's not able to uh, figure out why certain things are hard for him, or he can't keep up, whatever it is, or the teacher doesn't understand him, or he doesn't know how to interact with others, or it's frustrating because he can't express it, and he can't avoid it, and he can't get out of it, and he can't get the things he wants. So what he does is he yells and, and freaks out. Everyone does that. If, I, if you were placed in a class where they were teaching you Mandarin Chinese and you had no clue what's going on, you would probably end up doing the same thing after a little while. You'd get frustrated and you would be yelling at people just trying to get them to comprehend your frustration. So this is not going to go away with positive reinforcement of times when he's not frustrated because there are times when he's frustrated and somebody needs to figure that out. An FBA is a process that figures out what he's frustrated about and why he is doing these behaviors. So for example, when he's yelling at the teacher, something is occurring right before it that could potentially be leading to his frustration. This could be a multitude of things. That's why a professional has to do this because it's hard for you. But start with the CIFA. If you can, if the, if you write, answer the questions in the CIFA about that behavior, and the results give you an idea of, oh yeah, this is probably what's going on. Then good, you have the function. Once you have the function, the CIFA actually takes you to the BIP builder, the Behavior Intervention Plan builder, and it tells you how to handle that behavior. But essentially, it could be something as simple as, um, you know, right before times when he's yelling at the teacher's, uh, in the teacher's face, the teacher has now told everyone to do some homework that he doesn't want to engage in. Or um, the, it's very noisy and that is the time or uh, that's provoking this. Or he wants to go out and play and he un doesn't understand that it's not recess yet. Or, uh, you know, a million things. It could be a million things. It is extremely important to find out what exactly is causing the frustration that's leading to that behavior because then what happens is once we know that you replace his yelling with some other appropriate form of communication. Let's say he's uh, exhausted, he just doesn't want to be there at that time. Well, we give him the ability to take more frequent breaks and that will allow him to completely prevent, avoid these meltdowns and to get his work done. Or we find out that a particular type of work is too hard for him and we give him assistance or the school makes it easier for him. Whatever it is, we need to make it easier, more fair, and then more reinforcing. Right now, something in his environment is not fair. It's not working for him and we have to figure out what that is. And as you said, it could be a million different things, and it really does us no good to guess. And doing that functional behavior assessment or the CIFA is what gets to the bottom of it so that you're not guessing. Just quick example, I know a little boy that suddenly was having behavior in the yes. classroom, and they did the functional behavior assessment and discovered that there was a little girl with blonde hair that always wore it in a ponytail that had cool bows in it that was sitting directly in front of him. And every time she turned her head, for him that was a sensory night. Nightmare. Yeah. They moved his seat and suddenly <coughs> everything yep. was better. Yep. But can you imagine how much time they could have wasted on, well, maybe it's this and maybe yeah. it's that and whatever, yeah. and it was the ponytail? So, There's, you know, you just can't it feels tell. overwhelming. You can't tell. I had, I had a little boy, Shannon, who was absolutely a, a, just a terror in school mm -hmm. and really, really sweet and calm at home. And we figured out after a year that it was that he had had a traumatic experience associated with the bell, that the buzzer that, oh. that is in between classes. Yeah. And they wouldn't alter it. It was super, super loud oh. and very, very distressing to him. And that's why he wanted at any cost to avoid school. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And once you get to the bottom of it, the fix becomes that much easier. Oh my gosh. So invest the time. Um, and your school should do it, but if they won't, you have access to the CIFA that you can you can get it started and you can show them the CIFA and say, let's do this together. 
Um, but you'll see if you get the, the right function, then you'll be able to get the right behavior intervention and it cleans up very quickly and then he is a happier person. Right. And then he will learn more. It really is a worthwhile thing. So good luck to you. I know it feels hard when these yes. things happen, but when you do the right thing, then it will teach the school, oh, see, we can intervene and actually things get better all the way around if you will do uh, these steps that Dr. Grand Pichet was outlining. Okay. Uh, and, and please don't be discouraged and please be strong and go for it and get the school to provide you the services he needs. And if not, I believe there is, uh, I'm pretty sure there's uh, insurance funding in Pennsylvania. So I think that unless, if your school is not working with you, then start looking at medical insurance. Well, and, and here was the other part of the question that we didn't really get to, that you're still trying to get ABA. Mm -hmm. um, and and I can't say enough about that, how amazing that would be for you to have that at home to help you to be able to do. Keep fighting for it. Yeah. And, and I love that they're telling you that there are lots of different interventions for ABA, and, and that's really true. And for autism. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> interventions for ABA, no. Interventions for autism. And um, that's, that's a very true thing, and there are a lot of things that work well in combination with ABA, but the base that you got to have is ABA. Absolutely. So get yourself, but not just any ABA, you got to have good quality ABA. So I, I hope and pray that that's what comes for you. And if you want some help figuring that out, please uh, write separately to me, and we'll see if we can't connect you with some people on the ground there who have figured it out, because I guarantee you there are people, and help you to get the best information that you can to make that happen. We're going to take a short break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about a 13-year-old. So stick with us. Hi, guys. Welcome back to Smarty. It's February, and for this month, we have made a template for you. You can find it on facebook.com slash autism live, and this activity works on your child's pincer grasp. So let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are scissors, a hole puncher, a glue stick, shoelace, cardstock, and our template that you can print from facebook.com slash autism live. First, I'm gonna take my template and glue it to cardstock. And the reason I'm using a glue stick is so that it doesn't ripple, because if you use the wet glue, it's going to make it all lumpy. Once I have my template glued to my cardstock, I'm going to take my scissors and cut out the heart. Now that I have my heart cut out, I'm going to cut out the holes with the hole puncher. This is where your child's going to take their shoelace and start threading through it. Now that I have put all the hole punches through the template, now I'm going to get my kiddo to come over and take the shoelace and start sewing the outside of the heart. Shoelaces are great because they have the tip already making it easier for the child to thread it through the holes and they come in great different colors and patterns. As you can see we found some really festive hearts. Here's my completed valentine. Now it makes sense right? I love you so very much. <laughs> as you can see the child has a lot of opportunity to work on their pincer grass and find mold as they sew around the heart. I hope you enjoyed doing this with your child. Until next time, craft on guys. Bye. Can you see me flying by your side? Hey, I'm Candace Cameron Bray. Tom Bergeron. You're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. You're watching Autism Live. Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. We're here with Dr. Doreen Grampiche and she is answering your questions live. We're pivoting now to a question. Hello, Shannon and Dr. Doreen. It's a blessing to see your show every week. My son is almost 13 years old, diagnosed at five with ASD and had no early intervention. Verbal, but struggles reading. Uh, reading people. Reading people, thank you. Suffers from mood swings and anxiety. His therapist and myself have worked many years helping him improve daily living skills, awareness, safety, self-regulation, frustration, social interactions, etc. But for some reason, we never move forward. 
uh, different techniques, rewards have been used, and still no improvement. Instead, I'm working on the same goals from three to four years ago. I thought as he got older, he will improve some behaviors, but he is regressing instead. Now his fixations and things and routines are even worse. And he continues to behave more like a seven-year-old child than an almost teenager, including uh, preference of toys and games. He will tantrum over a Shopkin toy. Executive functions haven't improved at school either. He is in an ICT classroom and school is no help. How can we help him? What are we doing wrong? Please, any advice and thanks. So I, it's, I, I wish I, could, I knew more and I could help you more, but I don't know enough about him. The one thing that you do tell me here is that he has kind of, he's increasing in his obsessive compulsive behaviors. It sounds like he, you're saying he has mood swings and anxiety and that he has fixations on things and they're getting worse. And so that's very, very important. Um, and I want to talk to you about that. It, it also sounds like you're doing some pretty high level work with him because uh, not a lot of behavior analysts work on things like self-regulation, frustrations, and all that sort of stuff. I'm not sure how they're doing that. Uh, but anyway, I, I have two suggestions for you. One is that you should get on skills uh, because that's my only source of really giving you this knowledge. Or you can also get our book. But uh, skills is sort of a better place, I think. And if you go on skills, <clears throat> excuse me, and you go on two curriculum areas called and he's 13, I would still get on skills, the regular skills, uh, because we now have an adult version of skills, but I would get on skills and I would um, definitely go into the executive functioning and the cognition curriculum areas. So executive functions and cognition. Cognition will help teach him things like how to take other people's perspective and the executive functioning domain will teach him things like how to plan and how to be more flexible and how to uh, uh, inhibit himself from having reactions to things and very, very advanced lessons. Uh, if you go there and you'll, you'll answer questions about what he can and cannot do and then it'll show you the level of lessons that he should be working on. But if you go there, I would then ask that you give him somewhere at least 15 hours a week of ABA focusing on those lessons. Uh, so that means he gets about three hours a day focusing on those lessons if you can, or maybe two hours a day if you're going through the weekend. Um, and that's very important uh, because it will really help him in regards to how he sees the world and how he thinks of things. Now. All, everything points to the fact that he has a higher heightened level of anxiety and that is not uncommon first of all a lot of our kids or adolescents start to experience a lot of anxiety because they are uh, very aware of their own shortcomings they struggle very much to fit in they struggle to understand things um, and it just becomes really hard for them and in fact, this whole kind of uh, wanting to spend time with younger toys and younger level activities isn't uncommon at all because it's kind of like a, um, it's like, let's say, you know, a, a child who will uh, regress to holding their uh, blankie at night or, uh, you know, it's like the more anxiety we have, even as adults, when we have anxiety, what we tend to do is we will uh, it go, some people will, for instance, uh, wear jewelry that is, uh, you know, gives them some sense of comfort. Let's say something from a grandmother, an heirloom or something. This, these are things we do because we feel unsafe. We feel uh, scared, uh, anxious. And so there's things we do in order to make ourselves feel less anxious. Some of them are superstitious things. Some of them are playing with things from our childhood, whatever it is. But it's it's comfort. It's uh, whatever brings you comfort is what you're turning to. And that's a big sign that the rest of the time I'm uncomfortable. I feel anxious. I'm scared. I'm going to fail. I'm going to be judged. I'm going to do something wrong, whatever it is. 
So as you're working on those things behaviorally through these two areas of the curriculum, you might also want to consider actually talking to a psychiatrist and consider getting your son on a antidepressant medication. Anxiety and depression are treated with the same medication. Uh, anxiety medications are antidepressants. So uh, you might want to consider that. And there are some really, really good um, SNRIs or SSRIs. SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac, Zoloft, etc. SNRIs are, they work on both serotonin and norepinephrine. They're again reuptake inhibitors. And these are the neurotransmitters that we want to kind of keep more. Uh, the more of a neurotransmitter you have, these particular serotonin and norepinephrine, the less anxiety you have. So what happens with these medications is not bringing something foreign to your body. What it does is it just allows the serotonin or norepinephrine to stay in the synapse so that your nerves can take up more. They, you know, they can benefit more from these, uh, these neurotransmitters, and that helps our kids tremendously. You can go with very low doses. This is not something to be afraid of. Um, and a psychiatrist would give you a lot more guidance on this. Um, and it, I recommend it. Sometimes with our children, I see massive, massive changes with these medications. And it's not something that you actually see very overtly. It's, it's, very, it's not visible at all. Uh, people, you, you, it's really not something that changes the person's personality or something. It just makes them a little bit less uh, fixated on things having to be a certain way. And they feel just a little bit kind of more social, more happy, more comfortable in their own skin. So please also uh, talk to a good psychiatrist and discuss that. Because I would imagine it's really hard to learn anything new while you're in debilitating anxiety. A hundred percent. I mean, that's another side of it. But forget about learning. Like, nobody wants their child to be, you know, the teenage years are hard enough, right? Yeah. I mean, I remember yeah. 13. 13 is a tough time. But to actually be in a place where you are just constantly not feeling comfortable in your own skin, who wants that, right? Yeah. I mean, no, and there's nothing you can do, just even put, uh, for, just even don't even worry about learning. There's nothing you can do. This individual is unhappy on a daily basis. They're anxious on a daily basis. You must make them more comfortable. And obviously with our kids, there's just so much we have to force them through, right? Our kids have to go through school. They have to make friends. They have to dress well. They have to do this. They have to ease well. There's like a million things, right? And the reality is it's pretty stressful. Yeah. So this is not an uncommon thing. It is very, so many teenagers right now are struggling. When you think, I mean, and this is another way to look at it, honestly. I, I a lot of, when we have stress and anxiety, you know, we turn to solutions, right? So sometimes it's long-term solutions or long-term, let's say, reinforcers. Like when you have anxiety, you need more reinforcement to balance things out, right? So sometimes people will turn to healthy reinforcers. Others will turn to unhealthy reinforcers. So someone might, for instance, play with a toy. That's not a big deal. It's better than... Teenagers who will turn to drugs or alcohol. That is why they turn to drugs or alcohol, because they're trying to escape how they feel in normal life. Well, that brings up a good point. I, I know a lot of parents get really concerned if their children aren't playing with age-appropriate toys. Right. And at the end of the day, you know, I, I completely understand it, but it isn't the worst thing. No, absolutely. I mean... It's it really who determines, it's just like anything else, that if something is age appropriate or isn't. You know, my 22-year-old still has the stuffed animal she ha I bought for her when she was four. So what? You know, yeah. she's already, she, like, who cares? There are certain things in society and the environment that we do that give us a sense of comfort and there's absolutely nothing to worry about there. And there are a lot of people, quite frankly, because one of the big things we're talking about um, this week is is jobs and employment and how important that is. There, are, If you look at a lot of people at the very top of their game, a lot of people are doing things that they had an obsession with when they were a child. They just morphed it into something else. And not all of them morphed it that much. I mean, you know, I've seen, uh, 
I, I don't know anybody personally, but I've seen reports on television of these grown men that are in their 60s that have an entire room of their house taken up with a train set. Oh, yeah. And that is their thing. You know, and, and it has been, from, they have the same cars that they're playing with from when they were five years old. Right. Um, and they've turned it into a business in right. some cases. Some of them do go and work another job, but this is what they come home right. and do, and that's their every waking hour. And they're not on the spectrum, and nobody's pointing at them. Right. I would say that it takes the right people in their lives to understand and support the obsession, but, but here's, that's not a bad thing I'll, either. I'll give you another perspective okay. on this, Shannon. So for some reason, society thinks that having a massive train set is not okay, but it is okay to have 100 computer games. Mm. Your and my sons both yeah. are gamers, yeah. right? So when did it become okay for grown men to be gamers? <laughs> But right? it did. It but did. But it did. Yeah. So as long as, and that's exactly what that is, right? I mean, like my son, in between college courses, he's on there, and he's playing with people who are adults in other parts of the world, right? Right. So at some point, gaming itself is a, it's a child activity that became very appropriate for adults. So it's a very, it's it's all based on societal norms. Yeah. So you know what? If I want to go home and play with my puzzles, it's nobody's business. That right. it, it's calming to me and so on. It does, what I understand here is that for this parent, I think it's uh, concerning because, well, it could be two things. One is that, you know, obviously we want our kids to play with other kids of the same age and other kids of the same age are probably not interested in those toys. That I get. Yeah. But, so that's a very valid concern and, and you know, we understand that completely and, and you want to be able to urge him to do other things and be flexible and so on and so forth. I get all that. But I mean, realistically, one thing I want to like always caution our parents, because when we are in the midst of raising our children, we often forget what, what happens is that we let, I guess, not just society, but life as a whole produce a, a series of expectations that we want from our children. And then it becomes almost like, well, why? Then it becomes almost kind of a list of all the things that you, you, my child, are not doing that society expects you to do. And before you know it, it becomes overwhelming because then you're like, just you, you feel bad about what your child is not able to do, and you just feel horrible about the whole thing. And the child feels it obviously because you're constantly like putting pressure on the child. But if you step back for a moment and remove all the societal norms, right? My child, forget about all the my child doesn't do things and just think about all the things my child does do yeah. and don't fit them into anything. Just these are the things my child does. He feeds himself, he dresses himself, he goes to school, he does, he plays with these toys. All of it is fine, it's all good. Yeah. We start to get really upset and depressed when we think of all the things they don't do. Some of the things they don't do actually don't matter. Yeah. You know? So that's it just another perspective. perspective on it. Now Lisa has written it on Facebook and says that her son will only play on his iPad, never with toys or other things, and any thoughts on this? Yeah, so that's, you know, again, it's a, I, I tend to go on and on on this subject because it's fascinating to me. So, you know, Lisa, if it was, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, that would be pretty concerning because nobody else was doing that. But the reality is all of our kids are moving towards electronic technology, games on computers, et cetera, et cetera. Even when you see very, very interactive play uh, with the kids, with boys in particular, and I don't know the age of your son or the gender, uh, but when you see that, they're, that's what they're doing. They each have their own, uh, let's say, phone or iPad or whatever, and they're like just playing and talking while they're playing. And talking so, to each talking other, to even each though other. they're sitting this close to each other. There's zero maddening. eye contact. Yeah. And I talk about that, I find it fascinating because I feel like on the one hand, of course, being engaged like this is very non-social to some extent, right? Because we give zero eye contact to each other. On the other hand, it's becoming normal. Like as I was saying, this is society changing, right? Just imagine that 10 years ago, 10 years ago, a family went out to dinner and all each individual did assume that they had in their hands a book. 
right? Mm -hmm. And each individual sat there and read their own book. How weird would that be, right? But now, honestly, if you look at anyone at a restaurant, this is how everyone is, everyone. Yeah. And it's gonna get more, it's not gonna get less because we're just getting introduced to VR and like it's completely changing. So let's be accepting of the way that play and, and uh, social time has changed. It has completely changed. I mean, we keep adding more and more to our play curriculum because it is now much more computer-based. So, and it's going to get younger and younger. If you think about it, five or 10 years ago, uh, elementary school kids didn't have a phone. Now they yeah. do, yeah. now they do. So uh, let's be very clear, there's a lot of games on phones that are just for very young children. So as time goes on, you can be assured that schools will now actually have fewer toys and more computerized toys. Mm -hmm. And so our kids may still stand out a little bit, but pretty soon they won't. Yeah. You know, and again, I said, so don't worry about the modality of the game, of what he's, he or she is doing. Just uh, look at and see if he, ha he or she has friends. And the only reason that we want to make sure he or she has friends, again, it's not about society norms, but it's about the fact that friends are one of the sources of reinforcers that we have. So uh, realistically, if your child has friends who are interacting, then I have nothing to worry. You have nothing to worry about. Okay, but if they don't, then if that's don't, what to work on. Then what you could do, for instance, is actually see if your child wants to sign up for, let's say, a gaming club or a robotics team or something that has kids who are doing the same thing and they're all interested in the same thing. Our public library has a Minecraft club that there meets you go. twice a week and it's free. And the kids all go in and they there's a computer room and they sit together and they work on a mission together. Um, it's it's fabulous. fabulous. The other thing, next week on the show, we're having uh, Stuart Duncan on the show. He's the autism dad that created Autcraft, which is a Minecraft server that is just for kids on right. the autism spectrum. They get monitored. That, and if you sign up as the parent, they'll let you know if your child is doing something that you need to work on. And they'll give you praise when it's they're doing awesome. something good. So he's on the show a week from tomorrow. So, um, very nice. you know, it's a very interesting world we live in. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we've got a question from a second grade teacher about a student who is eloping. So stick with us. Inclusion is everything. Feeling like we have a place where we belong, and when I say we, I'm first and foremost a mother, a mother of a child on the spectrum and not, and gym owner and now founder of Caring This to Families Who Need It as well. My son is extremely hyperactive. Getting him to calm down is a very difficult task, so the idea of Rock the Spectrum Gym where he could just go and run and play and do all these fun things without any kind of worries and just go, go, go and bring down that energy, it just it helps us so much at home. You know, in the home or at school, it's not acceptable, but this is the one place it is acceptable for the child to kind of be themselves and get it all out there and just really just be their, themselves. It's an amazing place where my son could go and be himself. Um, you get to meet other parents who are in the same journey as you are. I think the most popular aspect of it is how they include all children of all types. Not just all only learning disabled, lower functioning, moderate functioning, high functioning, and non-disabled. Uh, non People there are so friendly, everybody's like family, they always greet you with a smile. There's not one negative thing I could say about any of the employees, they're all absolutely amazing. So I think every parent should walk in through those doors and see what an amazing gym it is. Now a diagnosis being one out of six kids are in some way or form affected with sensory processing disorder or autism, 
that's why We Rock Now is on the rise. People want to be a part of it. People know that they have a community there. They know that they can learn more information about things that they don't know themselves or that they can share, build friendships, and uh, basically get what you get in an OT facility, but it's not $150 an hour. It's 12 Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Graham Pichet is here with us answering your questions in real time. Uh, so I'm going to go now to a question from a second grade teacher. You know we love it when teachers write in yeah. because I, I'm a former teacher and I know sometimes you guys are out in the weeds trying so hard to make things work and you don't have the resources. Please we're, we're, we're building our platform of autism in the classroom because, for you. That's what we're doing because I know that you don't have other places to go to. So please keep writing in your questions and, and keep tuning in because we've got a lot more programming coming for you. So uh, she writes in and says, Hi, I have a similar question to the one that was answered last week. I'm a second grade teacher and I have a high functioning ASD student that runs out of my room several times a day. Sometimes he's back in less than a minute. Sometimes he sits in the hall or the bathroom. He runs out for several reasons when he disagrees with a peer, when he doesn't get his way, when he doesn't like what we're working on, etc. How can I get him to stay in the room? I have 17 other students, so sometimes I just turn around and he's gone. He's extremely verbal and one of the brightest students in my class. Thanks for your awesome suggestions. And I just want to say two things. Thank you, because what an amazing teacher, right? Yes, yes. And how glorious is it? I, I, you know, and I understand when you've got somebody leaving and you've got 17 other uh, little souls that you're responsible for in second grade you're really responsible for them but I'm so glad that it's only 17 kids and not 45 that's right because there are teachers that's that right. are watching that have 45 and have the same scenario that's true much better to have that's true 17 that's but true. still help okay so first of all I just love you like I can't even imagine. Yeah. like I'm just uh, envisioning this environment and I'm thinking oh my god this is the most adorable thing and I love this kid like this is a very cute kid who, what, second grade, we're talking about nine years, eight, seven, eight years, seven years, seven, seven, or seven years old. I mean, and what he's doing is basically removing himself from an environment that for one reason or another he doesn't like. Now, you have three different reasons listed here. One is when he disagrees with a peer, and ultimately, right now, it's probably better that he walks away from it than he interacts in some way because he probably doesn't have the capability to understand that it's okay for people to disagree. So that is a lesson that he needs. There's a lesson specifically in skills on this subject, which is essentially we don't have to agree on everything, and it's in the EF curriculum, and you need to he needs to uh, kind of uh, work on that skill to begin with. And it's, a, it's not an easy thing. It's just about pe he needs to understand that people have different minds, that these minds can have different thoughts, and that, they're never, that we are not going to agree on everything, and that that's okay. Everybody has their own thing. When you don't understand the fact that your mind is separate from other people's minds, it really disturbs you if someone says something that just doesn't fit in because you automatically think you have to adopt that. That's going to come into your brain now, and that's not the case. So that's just, as Shannon always says, we try to fix things immediately, and some of these things are longer-term fixes. I'm going to give you an immediate fix in a minute, but what I want is it, it's a short-term temporary Band-Aid. But as you do that band-aid, what needs to happen is this individual needs to learn more, this child needs to learn more about how it is okay to disagree. And you can just do that with practicing. For instance, you could just do it on preferences. He likes blue things, you like red things. He likes blocks, you like Legos, whatever it is. And then you just reward him being able to sit and discuss that, separate from when this happens, right? So you're practicing this in other environments. The other thing is when he doesn't get his way. When he doesn't get his way and runs out of the room, that is the worst possible scenario because now he's learned that if I don't get my way, I can just run out and avoid the situation. So that's, again, another scenario that has to be set up and worked on. And that would be very basic things. Like, for instance, you, want, you know that he wants something 
and you'll say, no, you can't have it right now, but you can have it in five minutes. And you set a timer and you both sit there. And as long as he can wait for five minutes, he gets his thing. So he, he starts to experience and learn patience. He starts to experience that things are not always going to happen the way that he wants and that he can cope with it. Coping is, is very important. And the last one is, um, is that he, do, he doesn't like what, what you're working on. Again, that's like, it's a preference. And so if the child knows that when you work through certain things, like nobody likes school really, but we go through school and then if you work on a certain thing afterwards, you're gonna get a reward, then that behavior is fixed. So what I'm saying is each of these individual things outside of this, like, and I know you probably don't have the time or resources, so I don't know, maybe after school for five minutes, or maybe you can tell parents that they should get on skills and they should be working on these individual things separately, right? Uh, or depending on the uh, structure of the rest of your classroom, uh, possibly you can get an aide for him who can work on these individual things. But these are areas of instruction. These are areas of instruction that need to occur not when he's acting out and running off, but at a different time. If, for a child who's very advanced and verbal and, and very bright, sometimes all you have to do is write rules. And all, that's it. If he can read, you just write a rule and you say, Things like, uh, you know, this is like, uh, we don't always agree, that's okay. Like, you know, I don't know what his name is. Like, John doesn't agree with whoever, but that's okay. John can keep his own mind, and Mary can keep her own mind, and it's all okay. Can Try I tell that. you, too, that in the core curriculum, I think it starts in second grade, that you already have worksheets and are teaching the difference between fact and opinion. Yes. Because you need to build that, because later on, when they write essays, they have to pr present a fact mm -hmm. and then two opinions to support their there you, you know go. two things there to support. There you go. So you are it's probably already in your curriculum but you can bend a little bit to make sure that you so you say is this a fact or is this opinion and when it is an opinion can we argue it and ever come to an agreement? So you just have to add that piece to it. You've already got that curriculum absolutely. in your... Anyway, absolutely. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. And then the short-term solution right now for you is to gradually shape his behavior so that he's not actually leaving the classroom. So behavioral stuff is funny. We always... So what I just gave you, all the lessons, the lessons are all more cognitive and things that we want to change and things that we want to teach. Behavioral stuff is much simpler. We complicate it in our heads. <laughs> if you just think about it, the act of what he's doing is he's walking out of the classroom. All you really want to do is prevent him from walking out of the classroom. So the way to do that is you can start with something very simple. I would do is just get his parents or someone to purchase for him some noise reduction headphones. When he's annoyed, when he's disagreeing, when he wants to escape, teach him to put the headphones on. That's it. Instead of running out, he puts the headphones on for five minutes. It's much more uh, like acceptable. Nobody's going to freak out. He, you're, he's safe. He's not running out, but he is able to avoid the environment. As long as he does that, and he will probably do that, but as long as you have a lot of times, what, what do we do? What do we do? Think about it. What do we do when we're overly frustrated or anxious or angry? I will often put on headphones and listen to music, right? Give him the ability to do that in the classroom and it'll be five minutes. And before you know it, it'll actually, once he has these skills, he won't have the need to do that anymore. But I don't see it as a bad thing because he's regulating himself instead of lashing out. Look at it that way. A lot of people get very frustrated and instead of walking away, they'll hit They'll aggress, they'll throw something, they'll lash out. Yeah. So he's better than that. He's walking away, and then he's coming back. He's calming down. Give him a different way to calm down. Okay. And that's it. I love it. I absolutely love it. And, and then would you do me a favor, and would you write back to us and let us know how that works out for you? Um, I'm going to take a short break, and then we're going to come back. We just had a question come in on Facebook uh, about a child in third grade. So stick with us.
life-threatening aspects of autism. Unfortunately, autism can be a life-threatening condition. There are things that are associated with it that parents need to know about. First of all, there's the risk of seizure. It's heightened in people with autism. There's also the risk of what they call elopement, which means basically running away. Elopement can lead to things like exposure, uh, drowning if they get near bodies of water, and uh, maybe being hit by cars. Being hit by cars is certainly something that seems to be emerging as a problem in people with autism. So what do we do? We have to take certain steps to keep them safe to start. That means at home. Let's look around the home first. Where are your points of entry? Barriers, doors, windows, access to bodies of water, gates, fences. You have to look at school because people with autism can sometimes elope from school or uh, things like that, daycare. So you have to make sure that it is written into their plan, wherever they are, that people are going to be responsible. That may include a tracking device. For some people with autism or Asperger's, a tracking device might be useful. It might help people know where they are. So in case someone has taken them a place that they shouldn't be taken, uh, kind of trick them. Sometimes you get that happening with your teenagers or they're just a child that's unable to communicate or speak very well and you need to know where they are. Consider that. There's a new generation of tracking devices. It can go on their shoe, can go on their jean, maybe in a cell phone. And I would also add that one of the most life-threatening aspects of autism is sadly being bullied, socially excluded, things like that. That's always happening in people with autism spectrum disorder. People bully them, exclude them the risk of suicide isn't unfortunately very high. So do not be afraid to probe, ask uncomfortable questions, see what's happening. Even if they don't tell you, you need to ask other people at school what they know, what they've seen. Even though it's an uncomfortable thing, we do need to be aware that this is a very dangerous situation at times. Be very, very vigilant. Stay upbeat, be positive, and realize no one person and no one family can keep a child with autism safe all by themselves. Get the support you need, look around, be vigilant. It's better to take steps you feel that you don't need too soon than too late. Welcome back to Ask Dr. Doreen. We're here with Dr. Doreen Graham Pichain. She's answering your questions. We're right here at the end, but somebody has written on Facebook and says, hi, I have a child, uh, third grade, and he is at a regular class. He's high functioning kid, good reader, but the school said his reading is low average level and I'm scared. How is he gonna be in the future? Is he gonna be able to pass to grade four? And a lot of times we have parents writing in about the fact that, um, reading comprehension when tested is not at the score that it needs to be. How can we help these kids? Yeah, that's, it, it, reading comprehension is, is very difficult for our kids, it is. And so we have a whole section on reading comprehension for in our skills curriculum and it is a, it's a big deal. Um, I, you know, instead, let's not worry right now, but let's just get him some help. Like let's, you, what you should be doing is you, you should get a therapist or a tutor who can actually give him techniques uh, which have to do with how, and you would be astonished how much this kind of stuff hurt, helps at an early age like right now, where you learn techniques like how to take a, uh, a whole page, break it into paragraphs, how to take a paragraph, break it down and identify the introductory sentence and the supporting sentences. I swear to you, if you teach him some of the rules around writing, it will significantly help his reading comprehension. Um, and that's what you need to do. And some of it is also for some of our kids, I just don't know your child well enough, but some of our kids also have an issue just because when it's a large paragraph, there's too much information on there. So it, it, either, it can also be a visual issue, so perception, um, of like there's just too many words and they're all floating around and it makes no sense to me which helps the kids take notes on the side thus again goes back to breaking down the paragraph taking notes on the side summarizing these are skills that help another issue that it becomes is just uh, memory sometimes when you go and a child reads a whole thing they forget the core parts because they're so focused on the reading that they're not really paying attention to the meaning, the semantics. So it helps those children to read one sentence and write in their own words what they read. Read another sentence, write what they read. And that, so depending on whether he's having an issue with the semantics 
or the visual processing or the memory aspect of it or just reading flex fluency or uh, a paragraph is just too much and it has to be broken down grammatical issues whatever that is you need to work on individually and a good therapist or a tutor would be able to do that absolutely and as a former teacher and somebody who loves reading i think uh, there was just a study recently too about kids who read aloud every day um, do better and if you take just five minutes to have your child read aloud and ask them questions I think one of the things if you look at some of these tests that they give our kids to judge reading comprehension I take issue they'll they'll put like 10 questions but there are at least two of them mm -hmm. that I feel are not well written and are confusing to me as an adult who was a former teacher yeah, true. and and there are, are gray areas that because they're they want them to take inference and jump to a conclusion and you know I, I used to teach test taking and if and you know you narrow down like you can rule out two of the questions but there are two and it really could be either way and if your kid gets both of those wrong both of those questions yeah. that could go either way then they're going to get marked down in reading comprehension so I would suggest you take the, the school's testing with a little bit of a grain of salt but don't don't let it go Absolutely. and have them read aloud and ask them questions like what do you think is going to happen next yeah honestly why you're do you so think right. they did that you're so right Shannon it has a lot to do with if you can spend the time with your child yourself uh, and Shannon is absolutely right if you can make reading fun that goes a long way and if you that involves sitting with your child as Shannon said you can read one paragraph and discuss it they read one paragraph and then you discuss it you read one he reads one and that makes a huge huge difference in their uh, in the child not finding reading aversive yeah and even you know this last summer my son and I did a lot of traveling and I was looking at all the recommended reading lists for high school students and I knew like we just don't have time yeah. for him to get all that done so we started getting books on tape to listen yeah. to in the car now we haven't been very good about it the last two months but one of the books we listened to on tape this summer was the Martian Chronicles and he got so into it but when when we were all That's the way smart. right when we were all the way done and uh, uh, we were talking about it and I was, it, you know and sometimes it's like pulling teeth right um, but I was asking him questions about things and at a certain point, and we talked about this when we got to Santa Fe, New Mexico mm -hmm. with the parents because we were so blown away. I said to him, what do you think this was about? What do you think the theme of the Martian Chronicles? And he kind of mumbled and I thought, oh, he didn't get it. And, and I said, but I, I didn't really hear what you said. He said, no, 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 it was stupid. I don't, I don't want to say, right? And I said, no, 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 tell me, tell me. And he said, well, if you think about it, it was kind of the, the uh, seven deadly sins. Oh my God. And I almost wrecked the car because I was like, wait, wait. And my head was going through the Martian crown. I was like, oh, wow. I didn't get that from it. And he did. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's kind of amazing. And, but I've been told before that his reading comprehension is not at grade level. And I don't think that there's another freshman in his high school that would have put that together. Yeah. So keep on plugging, but Absolutely. take it with a grain of salt because they, sometimes they see something that we can't see. Yeah. Um, and the testing isn't going to show that, unfortunately. Yeah. Anyway, okay, moving on to the next question. Hello, I have a 10-year-old with ASD and ADHD. I took him off meds, and now his behavior is really challenging, and school is struggling to keep him safe. I really don't want to put him back on the medication, but he's not learning anything and getting into trouble. What are my options? So, Tough I mean, one. can I just, oh, oops, can I just throw this question back at you and yeah. say why don't you want to have him on meds because realistically I don't you know I know a few people with ADHD and it is very very hard for them to pay attention to all the stimuli in our environment and learn from everything around them because they are just functioning at a different speed and that's just as simple as that. When you're running around and functioning at a different speed, it is very hard to take in. It's almost like watching a, for them, it's watching a slow motion movie around them all the time. And so they get frustrated with it. It's the same thing with people who have bipolar. I really just, I think that if he was doing well on medication, you're very lucky. 
because most of the time people with ADHD just have a very hard time finding the right meds, finding the right dose, and finding a medication that doesn't wear off. So, you know, I'll, I'll throw that question back and say, if he was doing well, I recommend that you would consider going back on the medication. You have too many issues here to deal with. When, when you have ASD and ADHD, often, as a, and this is a behaviorist the a psychologist telling you this, most of the research, not just with ADHD or ASD, but with every uh, mental and developmental and learning disorder, we, science usually shows that a combination of behavioral or cognitive therapies and some medical or dietary interventions together often have better effect than one or the other. So I don't think it is one or the other. I think you just find what works for him best. <laughs>